Good morning, everybody. It's so great to see all of you on this beautiful, sunshiny Sunday morning. I'm telling you, we are blessed. It is such a great day. So we're beginning a two-part message series on the life of David this week and the transfiguration of Jesus next week, where Jesus is seen like he's never been seen before. But today we're going to look at and examine the life of David. But before we uh, jump right into that, I want to tell you that uh, I saw this on Facebook this week, and I was kind of captivated by it, actually, because of the challenge. And it's some of the best words literally ever. It's what they're uh, suggesting and challenge you to use at least two or three in a sentence. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do that in a sentence, but I'm going to ask you to pick two words that just really tickle your mind or your heart or cause little giggle bubbles to come up from your belly and show up on your face. So pick two of the best words ever. And on the count of three, say them out loud. You ready? Okay, here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so because we're talking about the life of David, one of his big stories in the Bible is when David fights Goliath. If you were in Sunday school, you probably picked up that story several times. If you don't know the story, it's about this young guy, David, who is the youngest of eight brothers, and he is a shepherd boy, and three of the oldest brothers have gone off to fight the perennial enemy of Israel called the Philistines. The Philistines has this guy that stands about nine feet tall, and he is a giant, and his name is Goliath. And they've been battling back and forth as no one is really prevailing. And so Goliath issues this challenge. He says, I want you to send out your champion to fight against me, the champion of the Philistines, and whoever wins takes it all. And David overhears this. They can't understand why nobody wants to go out there because Goliath is calling them out and also cursing their God at the same time. And they're fearful. But young David says, you know what? Nobody else is going to fight him. I will. And so he goes out to find him. Only the king at that time named Saul says, well, you're going to need more than that, boy. Put on my armor. And it weighs him down. It weighs like 300 pounds. He says, I can't do that. But I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to take this slingshot that I've been using since I was a little kid. I'm going to take some stones, and I'm going to see how I can do. And he takes one of five stones, and he whirls it around, and he flips it towards uh, Goliath, and it hits him square in the head, and he drops over dead. And so the story is told about David, how he just takes down Goliath, this giant. But I just was thinking about all these best words ever. And what if the Bible writers were looking at that list of words and trying to tell the story of David and Goliath and had taken the challenge to use two or three or most of them in a story about David and Goliath? It might sound like something like this. The children of Israel were in a brouhaha with their arch enemies, the Philistines, and had been in a kerfuffle with them for quite some time. The Philistine champion, a giant named Goliath, was taking matters in his own hands, spouting all kinds of malarkey and poppycock about Israel and their God, challenging a champion to come forth and fight him so they could end this cod swallop once and for all. Truth be told, the troops were scared of this champion, chanting nimcompoop and his shenanigans, and had in mind to skedaddle before he got his tinter hooks into them. But David, the young shepherd boy, had come to check in on his older brothers who were at the field of battle. He arrived just in time to hear Goliath's challenge to send out your champion to battle him, and he saw the fear that it was causing. Flabbergasted by Goliath's taunt, the young whippersnapper took straight to King Saul with no lollygagging around and told him, I'll take care of that giant. No dingleberry giant of a man was going to insult his God and the people of Israel. Saul tried to canoodle David into his own armor for protection, but it simply wasn't a good fit. So David, with faith in God and courage filling his heart, went out to face the giant with five stones and a weapon in hand. He put one stone in that what not, what's it, whatchamacallit, flipperty chicken, doohickey, I mean sling, and whirled it around his head and let the stone fly. The stone gobsmacked. Goliath smacked dab in the middle of his forehead, and the discombobulated giant cattywampus fell to the ground dead as a doornail. And that's no gobbledygook, because I wouldn't bamboozle you on purpose, and that's the gospel truth. <laughs> so, a lot of silliness, right? 
And we got up for that this morning, right? So we're going to talk about the importance of words, especially one word that was on that list. But first, let's pray together. God, thank you for the beauty of this morning. God, would you surprise us? Would you speak something beautiful and truthful and real into our lives and souls today? When we encounter this story, God, would you awaken something deep, deep inside of us that maybe has never existed or has been dormant or disappointed? And God, would you awaken us to the truth of your word and the beauty of your love? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, David picks up a lot of the real estate of the Old Testament because he lived several hundred years before Jesus. He's a shepherd boy. He's the youngest in his family. He is a favored son of his father, Jesse, and he is anointed king by God before it's all over. And throughout this beautiful, amazing story, it is not forgotten by the children of Israel, the people of, of that faith for ages. And so we find tucked way over in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, it's after the resurrection of Jesus, they're going out and telling people about God's work all through human history in the centuries, and this points back to David, and this is what the record says in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, written by Luke, a physician and a companion of Jesus. After removing Saul, God made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, you can get lots of compliments, and maybe over the course of Valentine's Day, you discovered people who love you and care for you and people that you love and care for. But there's perhaps no higher honor paid anyone than what God pays to David. You are a person after my own heart. But it wasn't contingent on the next line. He will do everything I want him to do because the truth is David had some flaws. Not unlike most of the people in the Bible, because you can search all of Scripture and you'll find only one perfect one, and that was Jesus. And so today we're going to look deeply into the heart of this one that God says has a heart like mine. Now, what was his go-to? What was his fallback? What was go back to ground zero? Well, look at this survey of scriptures that were written by David in the book of Psalms. He didn't write all of them, but he wrote a lot of them. And from the ones that he wrote, we see this recurring theme here. In Psalm 147, verse 11, in fact, let's read it out loud. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Now, maybe you've eaten a few conversation hearts. Maybe you've eaten a few too many conversation hearts in the last few days. Look at this as a conversational heart, if you will. Psalm 26.3, your love is ever before me. David writes this. Again, in 36.5, your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Again, 36.7, how priceless is your unfailing love. Do you see the theme that's unfolding here? And then 63.3, your love is better than life. And then Psalm 100, verse 5, David exclaims, you are good and your love endures forever. You see what I think he got right? was that he always came back to reliance upon God's unfailing love. Now, here's a list of some of his accomplishments, his triumphs, if you will. He was a good son of Jesse, the youngest. He was a good brother. He's going out to check on the three. They're in battle. 
He's a good shepherd tending after his father's sheep and making sure they're all safe and fed. And in defending their safety, he kills a lion and a bear. And that was noteworthy in his life because I would imagine most of us haven't done that unless we've used some other kind of device besides our own hands and a knife. He defeats Goliath, as we've heard in that big story about his life. And he comforts a king, Saul, who's just going out of his mind with song and with words that come from the Psalms. He has a close heart with God. In fact, he will say, I've known God since I was born. In my mother's womb, I had that sense. And the, th the truth is, you know who puts that sense of eternity in us, that longing to be something a Part of the bigger story, God himself, he places eternity in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. And he's God's pick to be the next king. That's on the triumph side. But when we're making lists and assessing our life, if we're very human, we know that with triumphs, there's also tragedies, don't we? Like David has in mind, in order for me to be king, I think I could create peace by marrying a gal from that tribe and a gal from that nation, a gal from over here. And before he's done, eight women are a part of his marriage. And this fix doesn't work. And then he has a man killed so that he can take his wife. Not a good idea. And then he commits adultery. A man after God's heart? One begins to wonder, right? But would you look at the hearts behind those two lists of triumphs and tragedies? I think the hearts kind of indicate when things were going well, that maybe, just maybe, if we were to make the shape of that first heart, that there's this openness, God, I need you to speak into my life and lead my life and guide me. And there's that openness to God's will and God's love. And I think that when the tragedies came, he kind of closed off trying to make God the one that would lead. And he said, I'll just take this in my own hands. I'll marry these or I'll take care of that guy or I'll grab that up for me. And he's become his own covering or protection. Now, this might be way outside your comfort zone, so if it is, just don't do this next part, okay? But maybe some of us need this illustration of an open heart to God. God, be the one that leads me and guides me. So if you feel okay with that, would you just put your arms up like this, like that open posture of, God, I want the best in my life, but I'm going to get it only when I'm leaning on you and looking to you and expecting you to show up and be involved in my life. Now, if you would make that other one where, no, I'm going to just handle it all on my own. I don't need your help. And See the difference, that closed off sense? So in the midst of this, I started thinking about how do we handle our brokenness? And three natural tendencies that we have as human beings, whenever we've done something wrong, when we become our own covering and if we exclude God and other people, when we just kind of isolate, our first thing is to blame somebody else. Like, you did this, or you shouldn't have done this. And that blame just heaps more trouble into our life. But if I had a granddaughter, she would probably, it would be fitting for her to wear this t-shirt that says, if, I, if we get in trouble, it's my grandpa's fault because I listened to him. You know, that's blame at its best, right? I don't have a granddaughter, by the way, but my grandsons could probably end up wearing that too. Okay, so that was not the road that David went down. You don't hear him blaming anybody else. And that's really to his benefit. But oftentimes that's our natural response when things don't go right. The second is shame. And shame causes us to hide. From the very beginning we're in great company. Adam and Eve walk with God and talk with God and they tour the garden. They enjoy all of it because God says, it's all yours. You can have it. Let's enjoy it together. Everything except for that tree. Don't touch it. 
lest you die. And what do they do? They run right for that tree, just like we would. And then God calls for them to go take their morning stroll through the garden. Adam, where are you? Only to discover that Adam's over here hiding in the bushes because he realizes his vulnerability and his nakedness and his brokenness. That's what shame does. We hide from God and from each other and often from ourselves. And David did a pretty good job at going down that line until he got to this place. In Psalm chapter 51, he says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. There's that shame part, right? Against you and you only have I done what is evil in your sight. Ultimately, he realized, yeah, it caused pain in the lives of others. And it was deep and dark and heavy pain for him and for a nation and for wives and for families. But ultimately, God, it's against you. Because what I'm saying in my shame is I'm not enough. So I got to grab these things or you're not enough, God. Some more conversation hearts. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just kind of a representative list. Sometimes in our own human pursuit, we need to feel important or for others to know I'm important or feel powerful or act powerful in a domineering kind of way, or valued, or known, or noticed, or acknowledged. And friends, none of these are bad in and of themselves. It's okay to want to be important or powerful or valued or known or noticed or acknowledged. But when you and I pursue them as an end to themselves and don't care who gets stepped on or crushed or overrun in our pursuit of these, that's when it breaks us and others and the very heart of God. I'm not enough. I got to have that. You're not enough, Lord. And so on the heels of blame and shame because the ugliest cousin of all, and that's guilt. And in our guilt, we're overwhelmed trying to fill our life with that or many other things to satisfy that deep longing and hunger within. Revisit with me again, Psalm 147, 11, because we're about to find that best word. In fact, let's read it out loud. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. And that's the word, unfailing love. The Hebrew word is chesed. Now, I pronounced it just exactly the way it's supposed to be pronounced. It's not chesed, it's chesed. If you don't get a little on you, you haven't said it right. Just don't get any on the person in front of you because I'm going to invite us all to say it out loud together. Ready? One, two, three. Chesed, which means unfailing love. The only entity in the universe that has unfailing love is God. And this word is applied to God's love towards us. It's indescribable. It's immeasurable. 248 times it appears in Scripture. And it's like loving kindness, tender mercy. It's hope. It's joy. It's life. It's forgiveness. It's all rolled in one. It's indescribable. 
So even the words unfailing love diminish it in some way because we're trying to define the undefinable. So Ashley is going to be our model today. She's going to be God for us. Go ahead. You all can um, wave at, at God up here. Okay. And she's going to put on the chesed glasses, the way God looks at us and the world. And I think they might be these right here. So <laughs> now these are pretty good glasses to look at the world through un failing, unbounded love, right? But they're a little too Valentine-ish for me. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to give you our set of chesed glasses and let you look at everybody through these lenses. And let's give her a huge hand for doing this. Thank you so much. It's silly, right? But it's trying to say it's extravagant, it's wild, it's crazy, it's indescribable. But it's not something that you and I cannot know. In fact, that's what David knew. From the time he was little, he knew God loves me. It's not about performing and getting it all right. And I want that. But when that doesn't happen, he doesn't give up on me. He doesn't wash his hands of me. He doesn't walk away from me. He doesn't hide in shame from me. And I don't have to hide from him. And so in coming clean, he offers this beautiful, hopeful prayer. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I'll be clean. Wash me, and I will be made whiter than snow. We've had a lot of that recently, haven't we? Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. And here's the deal about God. When he hides his face from us, it isn't in a way of ignoring or excusing. It's saying, when you bring it to me and you confess it, we're done. It's over. We're not going back there again. Because it's unfailing, relentless love. And then he ends his prayer like this. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And friends, I think that's why he was a man after God's heart, because he didn't try to fix it on his own. But in every part of his life, good and bad and in between, God, bring clean to my heart and right to my spirit. Maybe we simply put, it's a prayer that goes like this. Lord, give me a heart like yours. And on this day, whatever you face, you aren't facing it alone. The God of the universe loves you more than you can possibly imagine. Don't turn away from that boundless, incredible, healing, forgiving love. It's for you and for us all. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's pray. God, whatever you want to do with this message, it's your turn. Because we're just simply going to quiet our hearts and our souls. And if you see if there's 
wickedness or brokenness in us. God, you want to weed that out. You don't want us to have that or carry it anymore. And like David, we pray that you would cleanse us. And though our sins are as scarlet, make them white as snow. And put a new heart in us, Lord. Thank you for your unfailing, forgiving love. In Jesus' name, amen.